glad that you chose to join us today for worship. It's great to look out and see so many smiling faces. I think I see some new ones out there too. If you're new, we'd like for you to take a moment to stop by the Welcome Center and see Laura back there before you leave. She's amazing, and she wants to tell you more about what we have going on around here. She's going to hand you a small card to fill out with some basic info so we can follow up with you this week. But don't worry, we won't sell this information to the public publisher's clearinghouse. And there's also going to be a nice gift that she will give for you once you fill out that card. There's some goodies in there that will remind you of God's love for you and your family. And also there is some inserts in the bulletins today. Um, there's one for a survey, uh, something about VBS maybe. But uh, the survey, there's a pink bucket in the back. You could just fill it out for us and leave it back there as you leave. All right, you tech savvy people. It is time to take your phones out and scan this QR code. We would love to have record of your attendance with us today. If you don't have a smartphone, feel free to text the word CHECK to 859-689-3535. So make sure that you check your family in. We will be doing a new church directory soon, so we, only, we want to make sure we include all your beautiful faces out there. All right. We're an important part of our church family, and we want to be true disciples who love, grow, and serve together. Um, in this life, we're called to be more than church attenders. So um, we want to be a real family. So if you could come join us on Wednesday nights. And here goes my mic again. Um, I hope you can enjoy us. Uh, future weeks, we're going to be gathering at people's <laughs> homes, um, different places throughout the night. So if you would like to participate in that, um, if you'd like to maybe host a Wednesday night, you can sign up in the back and pick your day. Give us a brief description of what you would like to bring. And that way everybody can bring something to accommodate that. So, I would just invite you that you come to worship today. Yes, we're standing on the rock, but we can do more than just survive. We can thrive in Jesus Christ. So, as we move forward in worship, it's kind of like taking a horse to water. Right? We can take the water, but we can't make you drink. Well, we can bring you to worship, but I can't make you sing. And for some of you, maybe that's beneficial. We don't want you to. But, Scripture says, make a joyful. We want you to sing and to worship and to recognize. And we pray expectantly that you will work in your life and you will do more than just survive that you have run. <laughs>
gets canceled, they lose my luggage. Um, just a terrible experience, which also made me miss Wednesday night practice. So I wasn't sure how this was going to turn out this morning, but I had to stop and realize and realize, you know what? God loves me. He's got me. So here we are in this shaky little life. Um, I'm just going to stand here and stand in his love. you show us. Thank you for the grace that covers us every day and for your spirit that comes down upon us to comfort us and strengthen us in those times. It's, it's all about your salvation, Lord, and we are just so thankful and just feel so blessed that one day we will live with you forever in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen.
last week being Mother's Day, I had some time after spent some time with my mom and my grandma. I got to mow the grass, and I had some time to think. I couldn't help but think about the saying that no one will ever love you but the way your mother loves you. Being an inspecting father and dealing with a miscarried pregnancy before this one, I don't know if this could be true. I thought long and hard about that situation and the impact it's had on my wife and I. The things that I would have done for that child to have made it through safely, or even the things I would do right now for our baby girl to be healthy and safe have been heavy on my heart and on my mind. <clears throat> Thinking of this brought me to a scene that I've heard many people say, I would do anything for my kids and my loved ones, even die for them. Saying this seems to be an example of your pure love and dedication to these people. But if you knew that this situation was actually going to happen, do you think that you would follow through with it? If we look at Jesus' example set for us in Luke, right before he was arrested, in verse 42, in chapter 22, it tells us, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Not my will, but yours be done. You see, Jesus knew exactly what he was about to face. He knew the pain and the anguish that he was getting ready to go through. Later in verse 44, Luke recorded that Jesus was in anguish and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. In Matthew 26, verse 38, he recorded Jesus saying during the same time when he was praying in the garden, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That's the severity of the situation that Jesus was in and the pain that he was about to feel was unimaginable. The human side of Jesus didn't want to go through with this, but even still, he never asked God to find another way, and that was the end of the story. He asked God for his will to be done, and that's the extent of his love for everyone here. You see, Jesus, he's the example that I talked about earlier, dying for your loved ones. The only difference is that Jesus didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk, and he completed this and went to the cross for our sins. His love is greater than any earthly love that we can imagine. And he was willing to go the extra mile so that we could have the chance at everlasting life. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this moment that we're able to come before you in worship and communion. Lord, as we prepare to take this cup and of this bread, I pray that we break down our walls, Father, and that we seek your forgiveness and your grace. Father, 70 times 7 is a lot of times, but you continually forgive us because you love us. And I thank you for Jesus and who he is, Father. He leaves the 99 so that he could find a one lost sheep like me. And I'm just so thankful for that. And if there's anybody here that's never known his love, Father, there's no better time than the present, so why wait? Lord, just be with Warren as he brings us a message. Lay your spirit upon him. And may it resonate with each and every one of us. Just forgive us for we failed you this week, Father. We love you. Amen.
Hodge was to come up here real quick, uh, whether it's this year or next year, I found out. Uh, but Constantine, Fiona, Ethan, um, and Carson. Where's he at? There he is, Carson. So uh, I got to meet Constantine and Fiona this year, and they are they are awesome, awesome kids. They're actually graduating, I think, next year. But this is like kind of our graduation because they're going back uh, to their country. And um, next month, right, is, this, is when you guys go back. Is that right? Or it's like late less than next month when you go. So it's, it's coming up. And so I'm sad to see them go, but I'm also excited to see what they're going to do um, in, in their future. And I'm excited to hear from their reports of what they're going to do. Um, I'll try to stay in contact with them as, as much as I can. And um, I'm proud of them. I really, they've come a long way this year. We've learned a lot. We've grown together in our relationships, and it's been awesome to really to to be a part of their lives. Um, and and uh, so, very proud of you guys, Carson. I've known you for the past two years. Uh, it's been awesome to get to know you, but to continue that relationship as well um, as you go into college. Uh, I know you guys all have future plans, and, I'll, and I'll want, if you want to talk about that, then you can. But I know Carson's going to Lindsay Wilson uh, next year to study what exactly. Mathematics, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very proud of Carson. We've, we've grown a great relationship as well. I'm very proud of him. Uh, Ethan, my man. Ethan brings about every single Wednesday or Sunday that he comes, he brings McDonald's or Wendy's every single time. It's never, we might have food here, but it, he always brings a little bit of food. Or Subway. Uh, or Subway. Thank you, Mario. Uh, and so Ethan's been great. I mean, we have grown relationships throughout the entire two years that we've known each other. And um, I'm excited for all of you in your future past. I just want to encourage you as you go along. We're going to give you guys, uh, in, in, here in the next coming weeks, we're going to give you guys um, your own engraved Bible, personal Bible, to keep along with you through your journey, your next steps, whether it's college or, or just going through life. I want to encourage you uh, to take that and to use that. Um, as you as you go through life, and I want to use this some scripture uh, this morning just to encourage you even more. Um, and the, the word says, "For I know the plans I have for you," declares the Lord, "plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope." Then you will call upon me and come to and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me you, when you seek me with all your heart. I want you to encourage you to seek Him through all obstacles that come your way, because they will come. And equip yourself in that way as well. I am so proud of you guys. Let's give them another round of applause. Give you a quick picture, just really quick. see them maturing and knowing that God's going to do some great things through them in the future. And we're going to, uh, it's good to see everybody here this morning. We're going to kind of jump right back into our message from last week um, as, as the lights come back on. Hey, all right. Um, so as we continue, <clears throat> have you ever read something in the Bible dozens of times, but then all of a sudden you read it and, and, a, and a new light comes on and you start to see something that you never saw before in it? I'll be honest, that happened for me in this uh, passage that we were looking at is Jesus called the first disciples to be fishers of men. And he calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John. I'll give you a quick recap in case you weren't here last week. But Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee. Peter and these guys were there all cleaning their nets. And Jesus asked to use Peter's boat. And so Peter put out a little bit into the water as he continued to clean his nets. And they listened. After Jesus had finished teaching the crowds, though, he asked Peter to put out into deeper water and just throw his nets in again. And this wasn't something Peter was real anxious to do because he'd been fishing all night long. They hadn't caught anything, but because he respected Jesus for all the things that he had seen Jesus do in the community there, and even for his own mother-in-law, he agreed. And so Peter went out and they cast in the nest. They caught this miraculous number of fish, so many 
that they couldn't even get the nets in. He had to call for his partners, James and John, to come out in their boat as well. They started pulling the nets in. They got so many fish that the boats were nearly sinking. Uh, and then they made their way back to shore. And, and Peter was so shocked at the number of fish. He, he says he's a sinful man, that, that Jesus should not even be near him. And Jesus said, if you, you know, this is my paraphrase of it, if you think this is awesome, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You've got no idea of what I'm going to do in your life. And Peter and James and John, Andrew, were so amazed that they pulled up with this miraculous catch of fish. They, it just says that they brought everything up on shore and they left everything and followed Jesus. And then I got thinking about, what did they do with all those fish? Because that's going to be a pretty stinky thing to have sitting on the shore if you just had this enough fish to sink a couple of boats. What's going to happen? And then I saw, I went back and I was looking at it. And one of the things that I saw there was that the father of James and John, his name was Zebedee. Uh, if anybody's looking for a baby name, I think that one's still available. Uh, and the, uh, the Zebedee was there, and, and all those fish that were brought in, while James, John, Peter, and Andrew left to follow Jesus, Zebedee had all these fish. And he got, I was like, he would have taken those fish to market, he would have taken all those, and I got to realizing that what Jesus had done was amazing. There were so many fish that these guys, they, they didn't stop to count them. I mean, it was a great blessing, as we talked about last week. We don't want to stop and just count the blessings that God has given us. But, but these fish were a truly a blessing because what Jesus had done is Jesus had provided for the families of James and John, Andrew, and Peter. That miraculous catch would have been worth weeks worth of wages. And all of a sudden, any concern that those guys might have had about leaving their family was instantly covered and taken care of through this miraculous case. Jesus provided for their families so that they could follow. You know, I'm getting ready to leave for Poland this week, and it's been a crazy uh, couple of weeks trying to get ready for this trip. Uh, so many things that I had to try to make sure were done, so many things that I'm um, still trying to make sure get done. And there were several things, though, that I needed to make sure were taken care of before I was gone. My family has needs. Um, I have obligations here to the church family as well. And, and I've seen how God's provided for every one of those needs to allow me to go and to follow where he's called. You know, my son-in-law said he'll help with the yard. Rhoda said he volunteered to paint something in the house. He didn't know that yet. But, uh, you know, he... <clears throat> Other people here in the church have said if she needs anything, just have her give us a call. Five guys from the church have agreed to step up, and they're going to be leading in the, in the messages that you're going to hear over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm excited about that. We've got different members of the praise team who are stepping up to lead the different weeks of the worship services. Um, I'll be totally honest. I don't think I'm going to be missed at all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think everyone's going to experience such a blessing. I just hope you'll be happy to have me back in a couple of weeks uh, whenever I get back. You know, it's awesome the way that God provides. Because often we can be a little afraid. We, we can have these questions come up in our mind. Well, I can't, I can't take the time off. I, I, I can't get away. I don't know how I'm going to pay for that. And, and all these fears will flood our mind. And our limitations many times will hold us back from God's calling. But one of the things that, that I've seen in this story that we're studying as well as in my own life is the question isn't, can I go? The real question is, how can I not go? How can I not go when God has called me? Because it's only as we begin to follow that we're going to experience so much of what Jesus wants us to understand in this world. And we miss it day by day because we're, we're holding back, trying to take care of our own needs, and Jesus calls us to just simply follow him. And we need to be willing to follow. But I want you to notice this week how Jesus calls these disciples. He didn't say, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men and then turn around after the Sermon on the Mount and say, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you and surely I'll be with you always. I mean, yes, he said those things, but not back to back. It wasn't as though Jesus asked them to follow him and then told them something and then sent them straight out. When Jesus called these men to follow him, it wasn't a figurative act. They literally followed Jesus day by day as he went through life. For nearly three years, they learned from him what it was like to truly know the Father. And they didn't just go to synagogue on 
the Sabbath and, and listen to a one-hour message from Jesus. And, and they walked with him daily. And I think sometimes we get the wrong idea of what it means to follow Jesus. We become faithful church attenders, but not faithful disciples. We don't really follow the way that Jesus wants us to. They walk with Jesus daily. And the reason that Jesus wanted them to walk with him daily is because so much more in life is caught than taught. Have you not found that to be true? More is caught than taught. We see and we learn from examples. And that doesn't mean that teaching isn't important. <clears throat> teaching is always going to be vital to your education and knowing more. But when we, it's only when we begin to see knowledge at work that, that what we know becomes practical wisdom. It, it's in the real world where things start to make, uh, take application and become important. I mean, geometry in the classroom, that's just annoying. But it's pretty important if you're trying to square up a building. Every time you drive down the highway, you're glad that the guy who figured out the radius of that curve knew some geometry. And if you're going to even just go out and play a game of pool, you better understand geometry a little bit. You see, it's practical wisdom that starts to make sense. And Jesus didn't just invite the disciples to do a Bible study. He invited them to share his life with them, and he challenged them each and every day as they would go through it. The Gospels are filled with how the disciples learned from Jesus day by day. And he would take occasions where situations were occur to be able to impart some practical wisdom to them. There was one day when Jesus was teaching um, 5,000 people, over 5,000 people, came around and, and they began to listen to him. And they'd been listening for so long, it was getting late in the day and there was no food. And so the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, it's time to send them away so they can all go get some food. And Jesus looked at them and said, you feed them. And they thought, Lord, that, that would take eight months' wages. We, we can't, we don't have the money to be able to feed them. All we've got is five little loaves and two fish. And Jesus kind of looked at them and said, watch them learn. Bring them to him. And Jesus prayed and he blessed those five loaves and two fish and he broke them apart. And then he had the disciples, I love the way he laid this out. He had the disciples start handing it to people. And, and, and they experienced how from God's hands, the blessing is always enough. And when it was over, you'll miss this, but he had them go around and pick up the remnants. And they picked up 12 baskets full of leftovers from five loaves and two fish. One symbolizing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. That God had enough for everybody. And they needed to learn that God was always going to provide. But they learned it hands-on with Jesus because Jesus wanted them to grasp this as he shared with them. He knew the importance of just simply seeking time. And the disciples learned over their time with Jesus how essential it is that we seek time with Jesus. And I know that Jesus isn't here for us to be able to walk with him each and every day, but he didn't leave us to learn on our own. As Jesus called the first disciples to follow him and to learn from him daily, we have the same opportunity, and Jesus has given us ways that we can grow and learn from him daily. And one of the best ways you've heard it said over and over and over again is simply the Bible. God has given us his word to teach that we might learn each and every day. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the word of God is living and active. It is, will impact our life. And it will make a difference. Through the Gospels, we see Luke's account of the life of Christ. And he tells us that this is there that we might know Jesus and what he taught. And the scripture is so essential to our life of being able to understand what it is to walk with Jesus. We actually see that Jesus used scripture in the same way. When, as he began his public ministry, the first thing he did was he went into the wilderness to pray for 40 days. And Satan came and tempted him. And how did Jesus fend off Satan? Through the use of scripture. He, he says when, when Satan tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread. He says it's written. Man does not live by bread alone. But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That was Deuteronomy 8.3. And if Jesus could use the Old Testament scriptures to defend against Satan. How much more can we use both Old Testament and New Testament scriptures. To defend our lives against Satan. As he attacks, we have the scriptures to guide us. And God's word is more available to us today than it has been at any point in time in history. Here's the thing. If you've got one of these, you can carry it with you every single day. 
Not only do you get to carry God's word, you can carry God's word with you in multiple translations. You can carry God's word with you in multiple languages. And you can find thousands upon thousands of devotions. And let's say you're not so good at reading or maybe you're driving the car. I don't suggest trying to read the Bible while you're driving the car unless you really want to meet Jesus. Um, but instead, most of them have the ability to simply play it and you can listen to it. Or you can download and stream multiple messages. Some of them might even be better than this one. You can laugh at that. That was intended to be <laughs> God wants to teach you. There are so many ways for you to learn from the best teachers that the world has to offer. And you're not limited to just simply what you're going to get here. So why would you want to limit yourself that way? God has given this to you. So use it. Secondly, we have God's Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be our guide and to teach us. And he said that the Holy Spirit was actually better than even having him in the flesh because the Holy Spirit would be in us. That he would be here to help us recall what Jesus taught. And the Holy Spirit gives us access to power, the same power that raised Jesus from the grave. And so Paul encourages us to keep in step with the Spirit. But keeping in step with the Spirit is, is a bit of a dance of sorts. And that's, you know, some of us just aren't the greatest dance partners, are we? We tend to step on God's feet a whole lot. But here's the thing. I remember when my girls were little, I would, we would dance occasionally. And I, but whenever we did, I would grab them and I'd put their feet on top of mine. And I'd bend down and hold their hands. And then I would just move my feet. And that's what God will do with us. When you're first learning how to dance with the Spirit, God will put your feet right on top of His. All you've got to do is come to Him. And He's not worried about you stumbling. He's not worried about you missing a beat. But you can trust Him to see you through. And it's beautiful the way that God will continue to work in us. And as we mature, we learn to dance well. And we grow to be a partner with the Holy Spirit. But it's not just with the Holy Spirit that we'll dance because we're a part of an entire dance team called the church. You see, God has given us the church as well as a third resource to help us walk with Jesus every single day. As we said earlier, we're here to do life together. We study together. We encourage each other. Together, we grow in a way that you can't possibly begin to do on your own. Before Jesus sent people out to be fishers of men, they first had to learn from him. And gradually, Jesus gave them responsibilities. And next week, you're going to be hearing about how Jesus sent his disciples out ahead of him to invite people to come and to learn about himself and how they would invite Jesus to come meet, Jesus, meet him. And, uh, and that's kind of like inviting people to church or inviting people to come to a Bible study where you invite people to come and learn about Jesus or more about Jesus. But eventually, Jesus was going to call these disciples beyond bringing people back to him to learn. And the goal was that they would be like him in the world. That they would be a reflection of Jesus. And we, we'll never be the Son of God. But just like the moon shines in the sky and you can see it, all it does is reflect the sun. And that's what we're called to do is simply to reflect the sun into the world and it will be a great light to others. And the goal was that the disciples would grow to be like Jesus. And Paul understood this so much that he told the church at Ephesus that it was Christ himself who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. And why? So that the body of Christ can be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and we become mature. What does it mean to be mature? That we would attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That we would reflect Christ to others. See, one of the greatest problems in the church today is adolescent Christians. We come, we learn, but we don't really grow and we don't mature. Anybody who's raised a, a preteen understands the difference between having someone who knows what they ought to do and somebody who does what they ought to do. And the biggest difference is simply maturing. I can remember as a teen, whenever my parents would tell me to do something, at first I, I didn't want to do it. Eventually I would do it because otherwise I felt like I was going to get in trouble. 
But when I go back home now, the question is, Dad, what can I do to help? Mom, what do you need? And there are times where I don't even have to ask. I can just simply go and do. And the difference is maturity. And we need to become mature, attaining the full measure of Christ, that we are doing the things that God has called us to do without having to be asked. And as Christians, we're not simply going to be church attenders, but disciples growing to be like Jesus in thought and deed. Don't be content with just an elementary knowledge about Jesus in your life. He doesn't want you to have an elementary knowledge. You need a master's degree. You need to know Jesus. Malcolm Gladwell popularized the idea years ago that it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert in any field of study. That means that after about five years of 40-hour works week that you will become a master at whatever it is that you do. If you've been doing your job for five years, you should be an expert at what you do. <clears throat> Let's apply that to the church for a minute. 10,000 hours. If you come to church on Sunday morning, one hour a week, that's 10,000 weeks, 192 years. So if you come to church for 192 years, you should become an expert in what? Church attendance. Because you're not really following Jesus, you're just showing up at church. Now there's two problems. Number one, you don't have 192 years. And number two, it's not just about attending church. It's about following Jesus. And see, that's why Mal that was the fallacy with Malcolm Gladwell's principle. It isn't just 10,000 hours that are required to become an expert. It's consistent effort to become better and more skillful each of those hours as you apply it to whatever you're doing to become an expert. You see, some people have been doing the same job for five years and they don't like the job. And they're actually worse at it now than when they began because they don't care about it. They don't want the skill, they just want the paycheck. And you see, if all you want out of God is a ticket into heaven, then you'll never become what God has called you to be. And if you're not intentional about becoming more like Jesus, then you're never really going to be a true disciple. You may know some things about Jesus, but you won't be like him. And you become someone who says, do as I say, not as I do. And that doesn't work too well, does it? You know, see, we're called to walk the talk. Our actions speak far louder than our words do in life. And Jesus understood that. What you say means very little if your actions don't support it. We see that in our political world. It's filled with rhetoric unsupported by actions. And, and I think most of us are, are really pretty sick of it. You see, anyone who has children knows this, but we don't always appreciate it. I, I've seen fathers who tell their kids to help their mothers around the house, but then they go off to do something totally different. What do you think the kids do? They go off and do something different instead of helping our kids follow our actions. They learn from not just what we say, but from what we do. You know, a, a Sunday school teacher, little Eddie, was late several minutes one morning to Sunday school, and, and the teacher asked why I was late, and he said, well, I wanted to go fishing, but my dad wouldn't let me, so we argued. That's why I'm late. And the teacher said, well, good for your dad. Did he explain to you why it's so important that you come to Sunday school? Yeah. Yes, ma'am, he said. There weren't enough worms for both of us. <laughs> Now, look, your example may not be that bad, but the simple fact is that if you say that you should love others, but you treat the people in your household without true godly love, if you don't love your wife the way that Christ loved the church, then your kids aren't going to understand what God's love is really like. And what's worse is they're not going to believe what they hear at church. Because experience becomes truth for us. And Jesus' talk becomes lies if it's not lived at home. Your actions tell others the things that really matter. It's how you live. And your kids are going to be more like you than you might like. And kids, you're going to be a whole lot more like your parents than you realize. Because behavior is modeled. And what you believe won't matter if your behavior doesn't support it. I read a, I know Father's Day is coming up next month, and I was reading an article about fathers, and, and, and this gentleman was talking about how for Father's Day one year they had the his kids come up and say what they appreciated about their dad. 
And as his kids were teenagers now, he was like, I can't imagine what they're going to say, but he was thinking about maybe the words of wisdom. And, and that was actually one question. What's the best advice your dad has ever given you? And he was like, what are they going to say? He didn't know. But when his kids got up, he said, the best advice they ever saw was that their father actually kept his Bible on the coffee table in front of the couch. And every day as they walked through the living room, they would see their dad open their Bible and read. It wasn't words. It was that example. And that's what they saw. That's what they remembered. What are your, what's your family going to remember about you? See, Jesus knew the importance and he set the example as he lived every day with the disciples. And we need more of Jesus in our life that way. We need more Bible. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We need more of the church family. But how? Because that's how we get more of Jesus. But I really wonder, how much Jesus do you want in your life? How much Jesus do you really want because I see a lot of people and they're struggling in their Christian walk because they want just enough Jesus to be saved. They want enough Jesus to be informed, but not enough to be transformed. Mark Batterson put it this way. When people do that, they end up too Christian to enjoy sin, but too sinful to enjoy Christ. And there's a lot of people who are not living the Christian life full of joy. Simply because we're too Christian to enjoy sin, but too sinful to enjoy Christ. We've got a little bit of information, but not enough to be transformed, to be like Jesus. And so the question is, will you make a commitment to get more of Jesus? Will you surround your life with him in his word, in his spirit, and in his family? Are you catching on to the importance of spending time with Jesus this morning? It is so essential. And Jesus really understood the importance of being with people. He knew he needed to get people to understand his purpose and how they could be a part of it. And I, I was kind of wondering, you know, did Jesus ever get tired of, of having to teach and repeat himself and, and talk to the disciples and, and all these people who were following him? You know, because I think a lot of times we're, we're kind of like uh, junior high kids. If you've ever taught junior high, you, you'll understand this. I remember teaching a lesson one Sunday about and going through that we're going to talk about encouraging words and how we need to use encouraging words and build each other up. As a matter of fact, there's a great Bible verse, Ephesians 4.29, that tells us that nothing unwholesome, but only what's useful for building others up should come out of our mouth. Let's look up that verse real quick. And, they, and one of the kids was over their Bible. Is that in the Old Testament or the New? And one of the other says, in the New, dummy. Only things that are helpful for building each other up. And you're like, you're just pulling your hair out. I think Jesus looks down at us sometimes and he's just like, Matter of fact, he says as much, Matthew 17, 17, he, he's, he says, Oh, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I have to stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? When are you going to grow up? When are you going to take responsibility? When are you going to start doing the things that I've been telling you that you need to do? And I wonder sometimes, does Jesus say that about me? Where is it that God's just like, you want to grow up? And I'm sure we've all caused Jesus to shake his head a few times, but here's the good news. He still wants to use us. He still invites us to come to him. And I think that was almost the point when he found Peter fishing again along the side of the Sea of Galilee about three weeks after his resurrection. It's an amazing situation, all very similar to the day when Jesus first went and he called him to become a fisher of men. Here after the resurrection, Peter and the apostles have gone back to the same area, back to the same job. He's back in a boat and he's fishing. And, and that morning, Jesus comes walking along the shore. And as he does, the, fish, the, the disciples haven't caught anything after a long morning or night of fishing. And, and all of a sudden, they hear this guy from the shore, You caught anything? Nothing all night long, they yelled back. Cast your nets over on the other side of the boat. And they threw the nets in on the other side of the boat. And there's this enormous, miraculous catch of fish. And as soon as the fish are caught, the other disciples in the boat are holding on to it. But Peter, he's like, that's Jesus. He strips off his coat, dives in the water, and swims to shore. After they had breakfast together, Peter went on a little private walk with Jesus along the sea of Galilee. 
And Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me more than all these things around? And there's so much that happens and transpires right there in that story. But Peter, do you love me? And Peter was at a point in place in his life where he didn't know if he could do what Jesus wanted him to do. But Jesus knew that he could. And so Jesus had to restore Peter to understanding of what he called him to do and to be and remind him that he would be with him no matter what he would encounter. I want you to know that you may not feel like you can be everything that God wants you to be, but by God's power at work within you, you can be everything God intends for you to be. And the question is, do you love him? Do you love him more than all the other things that you're coming across in life? Do you love him more than your security? Do you love him more than the blessings of life? Do you love him? Because the key to being a fisher of men is that you've got to be hooked on Jesus. You see, we get hooked on a lot of bad stuff. We get hooked on Facebook. We get hooked on drugs. We get hooked on the need to have other people stroke our egos and pat us on the back. We get hooked on our own pride. We get hooked on our own desires. We get hooked on our own selfishness. We get hooked on so many things. But what we've got to learn to do is to lay all that down at the foot of the cross. Because if you're going to be a fisher's of men, you've got to be hooked on Jesus. Because he's the only one who's going to meet all those needs. Father, I come to you this morning as we close out this message and we just ask for your spirit to teach us. Show us, God, what we need to be, work in us, that we can begin to be shaped into who you call us to be. God, we know we aren't worthy. <laughs> we don't have to be told about our failures. Satan reminds us all the time of how unworthy we are. Other people many times, Father, can't let go of what we've done in the past to let us be who you've called us to be. But, Father, I pray that today that we would recognize that we are called to be fishers of men that... It's about us coming to you and spending our time with you that you would be able to shape in us who we need to be. It's your spirit within us, Father, that changes us and makes us who we need to be. It's your word that tells us and guides us so that we can grow to be more like Jesus each and every day. We have the church family surrounding us that we can become more like Jesus. Encouraged that we can take whatever step is necessary, Father, to be who you want us to be in this world. Would your spirit work within us today? And Father, if there's someone here who has never accepted the hope and the power that comes through the presence of your spirit in our lives, Lord, I pray that they would invite you into their life today in that way. And if there's somebody who doesn't know what that means, or if they need somebody to walk with them in that, Father, I pray that they would step back and that they would find someone here in this church family who will walk with them. I pray, God, that as the elders are back there by the door, that they wouldn't be satisfied to just have information, but, Father, that they would reach out for the transformation of having your spirit in their life. And the elders will be there to talk to them about what their next step might be as they walk with the spirit. Father, be with us today. We commit ourselves to you, and we pray, Father, that you would give us new life, that we would be hooked on Jesus, and that we would be committed to one of you more than anything else that this world has to offer. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with us as we sing this song, and I invite you to make that commitment in your life and in your heart that you would give your life to Christ and that you would want him more than anything else. Yeah.
Amen. As we close out today, I know I kind of spent all my time up here already, but um, we have one more special thing that we would like to do um, this morning that, that's um, been on the elders' heart and, and my heart as well um, as, as we transition uh, and we go in, uh, in, in supporting Warren as he goes to, um, to Poland. And I would like Warren to come down here, if possible, to uh, the center here um, as I talk. And I, I would I would love to ask the elders to come forward as well. Um, I'm not sure where they are. There they are. Um, and during this time, um, I, I, we would like to go into a time of, of prayer um, for him, to encourage him during this time, as I'm sure anxieties are there, as uh, as... as um, as this is a huge transition, and as he follows what God has for him to do. And uh, this journey for him is, is incredible. When he uh, brought up the subject to me, uh, <laughs> I was actually like, yes! And then... <laughs> and so the, uh, this, this, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say a couple things. This trip to Poland came about in literally the last three weeks. I wasn't planning on doing this. It was just an opportunity that was presented and uh, just really felt God leading us to do it and I appreciate the elders coming to pray but really I, I covet all your prayers and I want to invite anybody who would like to step forward just to come and, and to pray with us here as Jared leads in this time of prayer. <coughs> to celebrate this transition of your mission for Warren for these next few weeks. We pray for guidance as he as he's going somewhere he's never been before. Doing things that he's never done before. Where languages are spoken that he doesn't understand. But Lord, you understand his call. And Lord, as he goes to this place and he he serves for you let the light shine from all his actions his words that are spoken his music that's played the crafts that he makes with his hands whatever you have for him to do lord let it be under to your glory lord we, lord we lift warren up to you to keep him safe during this time that you send down angels of protection around him. Lord, Warren's our brother. He is your son. And we lift him up to you as he is yours. This is a huge transition. And I'm so excited to see him fulfill what you have planned for him in these next few weeks. We thank you, Lord, in all, in all things. We praise your name. As there's going to be so much good that comes out of this, and we believe that. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Heavenly Father, we pray to you this morning that as Warren begins his journey to do your work in the missionary field, that you will be with him. Lord, we pray that you will guide Warren to spread your word. Lord, we pray that you will bring him home safely. In Jesus' name. Father God, we give Warren to you for the next two weeks as he travels to do your work to be obedient to you, God, as we know the, the way things come together, that's only you that can make this happen, that you have a plan that you're going to lay out. Father God, we look forward to hearing about that as he returns. We ask you to do with this con uh, congregation, Lord, that we would continue to lift him up every day in our prayers as he's gone for his safety, um, that you will bring him back to us uh, so we can celebrate with him all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's, it's a sacrifice. It is. To the
family, the time spent. And um, Warren, we're excited for you. Thank you. And um, can't wait to hear some great things that come from this. Just want to give one last round of applause for Warren in this moment. <laughs> I appreciate that, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go for two weeks. Uh, the great part is I'm going to be get, working with at least four different churches there in Warsaw that, you know, they've been, they were planted in the last 50 years, and they're reaching people every single day, and they're ministering to millions uh, of refugees, and the refugees that hopefully will be able to reach out and touch, pray for their hearts. Pray for what God can do for them, because that's the real, that's the real mission there. I know, I know that uh, God's got me. Uh, I just pray for what he's going to do in, in them and how we can be a part of it. And I look forward to coming back that we can be a part of it. Thank you. Amen. Uh, well, while Warren is away in Poland, um, I'm going to take a trip over to the Ark uh, encounter. Uh, this is not necessarily a church trip. However, I would like to invite anybody who wants to go with me. I'm just going to head down there for the day. I'm going to be here at 9 a.m. that morning. We're going to leave here. And uh, if you want to join along, come grab this. Text me. Text me. That'll tell me that you're coming. All right? We're going to go to the Ark Encounter. When? Oh, it's Saturday. Yeah, it's Saturday. That's probably a good thing to know. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.